for the opportunity we have to come and adore you, to adore you not only with our words and our voices, but with our lives. And so today, God, we invite you here, your Holy Spirit, to dwell amongst us as we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated just for a moment. Welcome to Campbellsville Baptist Church. I'm Brad Lauer, the discipleship pastor, and I'm glad that you're here as we worship together in, in spirit and truth. If you're a guest, we're honored by your presence. We're glad that you have chosen to be with us today as we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ. And so if you're a guest, take a moment. You can fill out the connection card and inside of your bulletin. Uh, let us know a little bit about you, and we'll be able to tell you a lot about what Camelsville Baptist Church is doing. A couple things we're doing um, uh, coming up soon is, one, we don't have church tonight, but we do have a special Christmas Eve service this um, Christmas Eve on the 24th on Tuesday evening at 5 o'clock. It'll be a special time that we gather. We'll take the Lord's Supper together, and we'll hear some other incredible music and also the spoken word. So I hope that you'll join us then. May God bless you. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. We light it again along with the candles of hope and peace as we remember the hope that we have in Christ and that he comes to bring us everlasting, everlasting peace and joy. This week, we light the candle of love is a reminder of God's perfect love that is found in Jesus. We read in John 13, verses 35 and 34 and 35, A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this brief, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. As we consider these verses, maybe we should ask ourselves, is this the distinguishing mark of love that I wear as a follower of Jesus, visible to others? When Jesus came to earth, he brought a special kind of love. This love is unselfish, compassionate, unconditional. He loves us just as we are. Our condition is irrelevant to his love. He gives us his love so we can give it away in the same. He gave it to us. He tells us this love will be our trademark. It will distinguish us as, we've, as followers of Jesus. Our actions reflect Jesus to the world around us. We can choose to offer love or to hold it back. In situations where it is hard to offer love, ask God to give you an abundance of his own in your heart so you are able to give it away. Let's pray together. Dear Father God, I thank you for this day and just for all that you've given us, God. I pray you would just help us to remember what this year is about, God, and, and what this time of year is about. And I pray you would just... Help us to remember your love, your unselfish love, God, and how you sent your only son for us, God. And I pray you would just help us to remember what it's all about. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
down from heaven's throne this earth you formed was not your home a love like this the world had never known a crown of thorns to mark your name forgiveness fell upon your face a love like this the world had never world of sin, this place of darkness, Lord, and you brought a light that we can't even fathom, but Father, you brought it to each of us, to live in each of us, Father, and we just praise you this morning, Lord, that we can gather here 
this time of year when we celebrate your birth, Father, and we can just honor and glorify you for being all that we need and for that cross being enough. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. You all can go ahead and be seated. darkness we were waiting with our hope with our light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
As the ushers are coming forward, would you join with me as a, in an offertory prayer? Father, we come this morning giving thanks. Thanks for this church and for the music this morning. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for sending a tiny baby to this earth to change the attitude and all the things that we're involved in. This baby has taught us how to uh, give, and that's what uh, life is all about, sharing, uh, sharing our resources. This morning, as you give in the offering plate, uh, we have several different areas that money goes. Uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering is one of the major ones for this time of the year. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, which we've just finished, and for our operating budget. So as you're contributing, it's going to many different causes, going across the, the oceans to other countries for missionary work. We ask that you be diligent about that. For all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God's Word. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. It's been, good, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. Matthew, chapter 2. When we think about the characters around the cradle, we often focus on Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. Sometimes we even include the angels and the shepherds. 
But you can't study the characters of Christmas and not consider the wise men. Although they probably did not come at the birth of Jesus, but instead sometime later, maybe a year, perhaps even up to two years uh, later, um, if we follow Scripture's account. As we study this story this morning from Matthew chapter 2, we will observe this. Authentic worship is the only wise and appropriate response to the Messiah King, Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to notice three responses to Christ in our text. So if you would stand with me in the reading of God's holy word, Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, thank you for what we have already experienced this morning in corporate worship. Thank you, Father, for the privilege we've had of being able to give back our worship through giving. And now, Lord, as we worship through the preached word, I pray, God, that you will strengthen my voice. But most of all, God, I pray that you will hide me behind your cross. And God, you will speak directly to the hearts of your people. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Three responses that we want to discuss from our text this morning towards Jesus Christ. The first response that we see in the text is this, that some will merely respond to Christ with intellectual prowess. Some will just respond to Christ with intellectual abilities. We see this in verses 3 through 6. The text that we read there, we see Herod the king heard this news about the coming of Jesus. And the Bible says that he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all of his experts, the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So King Herod hears this troubling news about Jesus and he decides to gather his religious experts. The chief priests would have represented the Jewish way of worship. The scribes would have, would have represented the Jewish law. They were basically lawyers who knew, taught, and interpreted the Jewish law. The experts give a quick reply. Bethlehem of Judea is where this king, this baby was to be born. And the answer came from Micah chapter 5 verse 2. They knew the Bible, these religious experts. They knew the Old Testament. They had great biblical wisdom. 
We know that Micah wrote some 750 years before Jesus Christ's birth, yet he predicted, Micah predicted, the small village where the Messiah would be born. And sadly, they could immediately say where the Messiah would be born, yet they apparently did nothing about the report that these wise men brought. Very intellectual but unfortunately very indifferent, very apathetic. What a deadly combination. Do you know what that means, church? This is something that you and I, we, we can't overlook. It's, it's, it's subtle, yet it's dangerous. You can know the Word. You can become very familiar with the Word of God. You can become very familiar with stories like Matthew chapter 2 and the birth narrative of Jesus or stories about the cross or stories about the resurrection of Jesus and yet completely failed to respond to any of it. A mere knowledge of God's Word is not enough because no one knew more Scripture than the chief priests and the scribes. Our motto, one of our mottos in, in 2020 as a church family will be to read the Word of God, study the Word of God, yet also live the Word of God. The Bible says in Ezra 7.10, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and teaching his statutes and rules in Israel. We want to read the Word in 2020. We want to study the Word in 2020 and beyond. But folks, if we read the Word and we study the Word and we don't live the Word, we don't observe the Word, we don't practice the Word, then we're being disobedient to what God has called us to do. What If you're looking already for a New Year's resolution for 2020, I can't think of a better one than to read the Word, study, study the Word, but also to live the Word. What we see here in the text is that some will merely respond to Christ with intellectual prowess, and that's not enough. Number two, a second response that we see in the text is that some will foolishly respond to Christ with irreverent pretense. In other words, with a hypocritical, with, with a hypocritical spirit. Look at the text in verse 3. You see the beginnings of this. When Herod the king heard this news about Christ, the Bible says that he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And then drop down to verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And we notice some things here about Herod's response. First, he was distressed. The Bible says there that he was troubled and not only was he troubled, but all of Jerusalem with him. According to historians, Herod was not well liked by the Jews. He was not the rightful heir to the Davidic throne. He was half Jewish and half Edomite. In other words, he was in the, the line of Esau, going back to uh, the beginnings there in Genesis. The Bible, all, or history tells us also that Herod was ruthless. Also, we see this in Herod's own story, if you continue to read there, Matthew 2, and how he killed uh, all the male-born uh, babies. Herod was ruthless. He had many enemies. And so, therefore, Herod was suspicious of anyone who would try to overthrow him. What did Herod hear that actually troubled him? Well, look at the text, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, after Jesus was born... In Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. He heard the news, Herod heard the news about the wise men coming from the east to worship, worship Jesus. And his response at that was being troubled. The word means distressed. Herod was disturbed, and his distress, 
And his spirit of being disturbed troubled, distressed all of Jerusalem. Herod the Great was so cruel and unpredictable as king that when he was upset, everyone was afraid. Reminded me, have you ever noticed how sometimes the distress or trouble that you're experiencing on, in your own life, maybe at home or at work, how that affects everyone around you, the rest of your family, how it affects the rest of your co-workers or your classmates. Your unsettled heart at work or at home or at school tends to unsettle others. Well, think about it from this standpoint, even more so for a king of a nation, for Herod. Herod was distressed, but secondly, we see in the text that Herod was deceitful. Herod was deceitful. We saw that in verses 7 and 8. His intention here was to use the, the magi or the wise men to determine the exact location of this new king. His outward appearance seemed honest. His words, Herod's words seemed honest, yet he clearly had no intention of worshiping Jesus. And so what we see is that Herod put up a facade of wor worshiping Jesus when in all actuality he was going to kill Jesus to solidify his hold of the throne. Now how do we know this? Well, if we continue to read, look at verse 12 in chapter 2. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed, the wise men did, to their own country. And then verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him, not to worship him. And he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Herod merely just put up a facade, just out of a hypocritical spirit. He had no intentions of worshiping Jesus. And by the way, what a reminder here that Satan's best devised strategies cannot derail God's plan for rescuing mankind from their sin. Could, can't derail what God had sovereignly put together in this plan. The spirit of Herod's hypocrisy, by the way, church, is alive and well in many of our churches today. One of the greatest lies that is perpetrated in church today is for someone to put up the facade of Jesus worship when they're simply here just to be seen or for other ulterior motives. Some will foolishly respond to Christ with irreverent pretense. But there's a third response that we see in the text. Some will wisely respond to Christ with intense passion. Look at the text. We saw in verse 1 and 2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. And now drop down to verse 9. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, notice their reaction. These wise men rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. We save the best and the most appropriate response to Christ for last. What do we know about these wise men? Well, a Tradition attempts to give them names, number, their means of transportation, or even their country or countries of origin. 
But the Bible does not give us these answers. We really don't know. We don't know that there were, there were only three. We know that there were three gifts, but there could have been more than three wise men. Tradition gives us their names, but the Word of God does not give us their names. We don't know how they got there, camel or horse or whatever the case may be, or whatever, what even countries they come from, we don't know. We know they came from the east. And they were, we know from the word, they were astrologers, men who studied the stars, who often would advise the kings. They probably practiced occult practices, including sorcery. It's from their names that our words magic and magician are even derived. We also know that they came from the east, which tells us that they were Gentiles, they were non-Jews. We also know from the text that they were seekers. The construction in verse 2 of the word saying conveys the idea that they went around the city questioning everyone that they met. The text is, is leading us to believe that this was this is something that they asked over and over and over. They were seeking who this king really and truly was. I want to share with you one thought about the star and two thoughts about these wise men. First, don't miss the star's extraordinary goal. Don't miss the star's extraordinary goal. In verse 9, the text tells us, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. The star that they had seen in the east now reappeared and led them to a specific house in Bethlehem where they found the child. Notice that it's a house now, not a stable, where we see the shepherds visit the newborn baby Jesus in Luke chapter 2. This is a different setting. Also, he's a child, not a newborn baby, probably one to two years old at this point. By the way, there's all kind of efforts to try to explain away this star or to just to explain this star in general as a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. I've heard some say that perhaps it was a supernova or a comet, and I guess it could have been but really, all the answers to me are just truly comical. Perhaps the same glory, Shekinah glory, that led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night led these wise men to Jesus. I agree with John Piper about the supernatural nature of this star. He said, what is plain concerning this matter of the star is that it is doing something that it cannot do on its own. It is guiding magi, wise men, to the Son of God to worship him. And there's only one person in biblical thinking that can be behind that intentionality in the stars, and that's God himself. So the lesson is plain. God in his sovereignty with his providential hand is guiding foreigners to worship him. The reminder once again is this, we serve a God who is a global God. Let me remind you that this is a great time for us to be mindful of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that we take up as Southern Baptist every year. It's an opportunity for us to support our over 4,000 or almost 4,000 international missionaries who are serving all over the world. But I would add, let's do more than just give. Let's pray in 2020 for unreached people groups who have never heard the gospel, the good news. They've, they've never heard these stories that you and I simply take for granted. Let's pray by name for some of our missionaries. But what if you considered not only giving and praying in 2020, but also going or sending someone else so that they can go if you physically can't? We have trips in January, a trip in January to Belize. We've got a team going in January 
We have a, a team going to Alaska in the summer. And I'm sure we could talk to Robbie Spear and he'd love to get you involved in a trip in 2020 to take the gospel to the nations. Don't miss this star's extraordinary goal. Number two, don't miss the wise men's exceeding gladness. We've already read it there in verse 10. When they saw the star, this, the star that they had been searching so diligently for, the Bible says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. In other words, when they saw the star again, they were overcome with great joy. It's a quadruple way of saying that they rejoiced. Think of it. It would have been much to say that they rejoiced, more to say that they rejoiced with joy, more to say that they rejoiced with great joy, and even more to say that they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Someone once said the real story of the wise men is not found in what they gave, it's found in what they received. Look at what happened after they acknowledged the star that would lead them to Jesus. They were overjoyed. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to get it. They were filled with joy. They were filled with emotion because they were getting to do and they were going to do what all of us are created to do. They were submitting to Jesus and worshiping the king. This week I was thinking about what's your joy level? You know when you're in the hospital or you go to the doctor and the nurse asks this question, what's your pain level on a scale of one to 10? One being not too bad, you know, dull pain, whatever, but 10 being an unbelievable pain. What would you rank your joy level on a scale of one to 10? Is your joy low? Say maybe a one or a two? Are you just kind of, it's good one moment, not so good the next, maybe you give yourself a, a four or five? Or is your joy level a nine or a 10? Are you, are you excited not only about Christmas, spending time with family and all of that, but you're excited and joyful because of Jesus? What would you rank your joy level? What would it take for that number to increase, your joy level number to increase? And the best question yet is this, what are you gonna do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to see that your joy level in Jesus increases? Don't miss these wise men and their exceeding gladness. And then thirdly, don't miss the wise men and their extravagant gifts. This is usually what draws our attention, right? To Matthew chapter 2, these gifts. Look at verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The significance of these gifts are probably sometimes maybe even overstated a little bit. They were sacrificial to say the least. These were costly luxury items suitable as gifts for the birth of an emperor or a king or some other royal figure. Some scholars do not attach any symbolic importance to, these, to the specific nature of these gifts. Frankincense and myrrh were both valuable goods from the East. Gold was a standard for currency. However, there are some scholars that see possibilities of symbolic importance. Notice the one that we often live out leave out, we go straight to the frankincense, gold, or myrrh, and we leave out their gift of worship. Don't miss that. The Bible's very clear that these pagan men came and they worshiped this child. And so worship is a gift that's fit for God himself, our Savior. 
But they also gave gold, which is a gift fit for a king. This gift acknowledged that Jesus was and is the king. Remember, this has been Matthew's primary goal in writing so far in chapters 1 and 2 to see his, his royal lineage through the line of David and even his virgin birth. But we also see frankincense. Frankincense was a gift that was fit for a priest. This, there was incense that the priest used in the temple. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 30. It was used as the base and holy incense. And by giving it, these wise men acknowledged that Jesus was a priest. Whether they realized it or not, the one who would bring us to God through his death on the cross. And then the next gift was myrrh. Myrrh was a gift for the dead. It was a fragrant ointment that was valuable and it was used to actually embalm the dead. This little baby, we know the rest of the story, was born to die. Christmas is not the end, but only the beginning. Jesus will go from the cradle to the cross and from the cross to the crown. But folks, listen to me. He is no longer in the cradle and he is no longer on the cross. Jesus Christ is the king and he reigns alone on his throne. Don't miss the wise men and their extravagant gifts. Typical of last minute Christmas shoppers, there was a mother <clears throat> who was running furiously from store to store. Anybody going to be doing that this afternoon? I hope not for your sake. Suddenly, she became aware that the hand of her little three-year-old boy was no longer clutched to her hand. And so in a panic, she retraced her steps and found him standing with his little nose pressed flatly against a frosty window. He was, ga he was gazing at a manger scene and hearing his mother's call, he turned and shouted with an innocent joy. Look, mommy, it's Jesus. Baby Jesus is in the hay. With obvious indifference to his joy and wonder, she impatiently jerked him away saying, we don't have time for that, son. And what was true for that busy mother is sadly true for far too many of you in this room or those of you watching at home, too busy. Some of you have an intellectual awareness of Jesus like the religious leaders, but are simply too indifferent to care. Some of you are actually troubled and hypocritical like King Herod towards Jesus. You say all the right answers that you want to worship Jesus, but Truly, it's just an act. But, oh, friend, hear me. The only wise and appropriate response to Jesus Christ, the Messiah King, is authentic worship. Would you stand with me? Our musicians are going to come. We're just going to have an opportunity to respond to him this morning to respond to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done in coming in the most humble way, in dying on the cross for our sins. for arising from the grave and conquering death, for providing a way for our salvation. Lord, we pray that our response to you this Christmas, and not only this Christmas, but every day of our life, Father, would be a response of worship. Worship fit for a king. Worship fit for the Savior.
Lord, forgive us for any other response that's inappropriate. Lord, would your Holy Spirit even now begin speaking to hearts and lives? Lord, would you reveal to every heart in this room if there's ever been a time in their life where they have given their heart and their soul to Jesus and Jesus alone. And if not, Lord, we pray that they would turn from their sin today and they would turn to Jesus for salvation. That they would allow Jesus to rescue them. Father, we also pray for any believers in this room that are troubled in their spirit. Maybe they've not been worshiping you as they should authentically. Lord, would you speak to their hearts? Lord, would you bring conviction where conviction is needed? Lord, would this, we pray that this time of response, Lord, it completely belongs to you. It's not mine. It's not any others. Lord, it belongs to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together this morning, we invite you. We've got some pastors that are available. They would love to pray with you if you have something to pray about. If God's dealing with your heart, we're available. We invite you to come this morning and respond by faith to Jesus. Amen. God is good all the time. Now the microphone works, right? And you know why? Because I actually turned it on. If y'all will be seated just for a moment. <clears throat> not, not their fault. It was my fault. All right. Um, real quick, we've got a couple of uh, closing thoughts. Boy, this really would have helped too with my hoarse throat, right? Um, we have a journal really excited about this. Brad and Carrie and others have worked really, really hard on this. Um, it's got the little motto or the statement that I mentioned during the message this morning, read it, study it, live it. Uh, we have a Bible reading plan that we have adopted for 2020, and we have copies of it. It's a chronological Bible reading plan that where you'll read, we'll read through the Word of God together in 2020 and then you can also use these little prayer journals and be able to journal through God's Word as well. We want to encourage you to to pick this up. I believe they're going to be at the doors. All right, we'll have some people that will be handing these out. So I hope that we run out. That would be a good problem to have and we'll have to get some more. Uh, but 2020 is right 
not far, right? Just another week or two or so. So we want you to grab one of these and be able to read God's Word together with us in 2020. All right? I think that's it that I have. Jeremy has a few closing words and then we'll be dismissed. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, no evening service tonight. Uh, and then join us Tuesday uh, for the Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock, right back in here, uh, for a very special time. And then this Saturday is the first work day um, for the fellowship hall. So you, it starts it's from 9 to 4. So if you have an hour or two, come in, help for a little bit. So the, the first work day for the fellowship hall renovations is this Saturday. And then next Sunday, next Sunday there's no Sunday school, uh, only one service at 10 o'clock. Um, so be here at 10 o'clock uh, next Sunday. And we want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And then we're going to pray and then we'll all be dismissed. So let's pray together. Lord Dad, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we can come and to worship your great name and to worship uh, your son. And I pray that um, as everyone leaves here today, Father, that um, they'll be blessed in their travels and that everyone will be safe as they go see family and as they travel around and help us to remember um, to be wise and to follow you and to rejoice at your birth and to give glory to you and to you alone. We love you and it's your name we pray. Amen.